really? Hmm. We're the only ones. Hmm.
Recording in progress. Howdy. Hi. I was beginning to wonder if we were going to have Bible study today. I'm trying to get this to work. I, 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 there we go. Hello, Melody. Randy Powell. Hello, Huey. Hey, Randy. How's it going? I'm pretty darn good. I've got Elizabeth here. There you go. That's good. Tell her to behave. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. So there you go. Thank you. Whoa, what was that? Morning, everybody. Hi. Hi. You Hi. You know what? I forgot. I need my glasses. Hang tight. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. How's everybody today? Just fine. Good. Good. All right. Well, um, we have you guys at home, but we also have um, Teresa and Jenny in my office. They are here as well. So um, that's just not fair. Here. What? <laughs> <laughs> They're working today. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> Huey, you're so mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness hi teddy hi melody hi elizabeth Hello. is steph gonna join us or is she at the luncheon she's at the luncheon okay very good all right you know where she's at okay great melody how are things with you doing okay good and in there anyway 
Good. It's good to see you. Well, have we any prayer requests for this week? <clears throat> so Jim and Jana Callen have everything packed up today is their last official day in Alvin before they head out tomorrow. They said um, everything, everything went well. So um, um, they are really excited about um, moving forward and um, they said all is packed up. They had no idea how much stuff that they had until <laughs> the movers came yesterday. <coughs> so we will give thanks to God for that, huh? Any other prayer requests? Don't be shy. None? Okay, let me look and make sure I'm not leaving anybody else off. Um, let's remember Chris Lowe in our prayers and um, be mindful of him. And also, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Kelly Ackley's on bed rest waiting for her um, baby to be born. And so she's not able to work and she is spending a lot of time at home in bed. So just be mindful of her as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Leslie Folds, we've been praying for her. This is Charlie and Francis Lamb's daughter. She got word yesterday that she's been approved for surgery. Thanks be to God. So she'll finally be able to get her broken leg fixed. They were worried about blood clots. And so, um, Gratefully, all of that has kind of worked itself out, and um, they let me know yesterday that um, she is um, going to be ready for surgery sometime soon. So that's wonderful, too. Fine. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, if we don't have any other prayers, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer and then um, we will dive in, okay? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God, we ask for your spirit to settle us now and allow us to be present God, whatever worries or um, concerns we may have that are filling our minds and hearts, Lord, I pray during this time that we might be able to set it aside and focus on you. Um, we ask, oh God, for your peace. We ask, Lord, for good learning. We ask, Lord, for your direction. God, open our hearts and our minds so that we might learn more of you, so that we can love you more dearly and see you more clearly. Be with every person who is here. And again, we give this time to you and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. A little bit, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh-huh. Okay. I was kind of mumbling, I guess, when I prayed, Elizabeth. Sorry. All right. I'll speak up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Does anybody remember where we left off yesterday, or yesterday last week? Two weeks. Oh, that's right. Two weeks. Because what was last week? Okay. Yeah. The no electricity day, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chapter 32 thank you sir that's where i've landed too <laughs> so if you have a bible exodus chapter 32 so let's back up and um let's go back to 31 verse 18 
when he finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. Okay, so Moses has officially received the stone tablets, better known as what? The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Great. Just so we're all on the same page. Now let's um, head on into chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron replied to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. The gold from them fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into an image of a calf. Then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it and made an announcement. There will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. Early the next morning, they arose, offered burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. The Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once. For your people who brought you up from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Okay, so let's stop right here. Um, remember chapter 32 is kind of long. Um, and let's just kind of parse our way through um, what is happening and um, perhaps what some of the meaning is behind some of this stuff that may not be as clear um, to us these days. First of all, how long has Moses been on the mountain with God? 40 days and nights. Yes. Yes. And have we seen that before? I want to say yes, but I'm not, I couldn't tell you prior to that. Yeah, but that I don't remember what the event was. Yeah, we have seen it yet. Do you guys remember um, Noah and the Ark? How many days he was on the boat? Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, forty days and forty nights. And how long? How long has Israel been wandering through the wilderness? Forty years. So we have this notion of forty. It means something. And of course, you know, that is carried over into the New Testament. Um, so we know that when dealing with round numbers, especially round number 40, um, because of our patterning in scripture, we know that God is somehow in the midst of that, right? Purely by the number 40. Was God um, gracious to, to Noah? Did he save Noah? Yes. Yes. Was God gracious to the people of Israel for 40 years and providing food for them and leading them through the wilderness and yeah. leading them? Well, we don't know this yet, but eventually to the promised land? Yes. Yeah. So here again, we have a man, Moses, who has been summoned by God to be with him on a mountain. Remember mountains in scripture? What happens on mountains? Do insignificant things happen on mountains no. in scripture? No. 
It doesn't matter what mountain you are on. It doesn't matter what the name of the mountain is. If you've been called by God up to a mountain and you are going up to him, something significant is going to happen. And that is exactly what has happened here with Moses. <coughs> so the people in kind, how do they respond to Moses being on the mountain for 40 days? Are they patient? Are they understanding? Are they no? no. How how do they respond? I don't know the uh, I feel that somebody else. Okay. Um, I'll read to you the first, first sentence, which gives us the answer. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, come make gods. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa says that, that they've already forgotten. So they think, they remember who led them out and it's this dude named Moses, but they don't know where he is. And we don't know what's happened to him. And so, Aaron, you need to do something about it. And so we think um, you need to make things so that we're not uncomfortable anymore. We waited long enough. We've waited our 40 days and we're done. <clears throat> so what does Aaron say back to them? <laughs> Give me your gold and I'll make you an idol. I'll make you a god. Uh huh. Yeah. So do you guys do y'all find this a bit odd, considering uh -huh. Aaron yeah. is Moses's brother, and he uh -huh. too has been traveling, and he too is a of the, the of the God of Israel who has led them through the wilderness, and instead of reminding the people of that, what does he tell them? He tells them, take off your gold, take your rings, your earrings, and bring them to me. And so the people took them off and they went to him and then he took them. And what did he do? Fashion them into a golden calf. Yes. And the Hebrew is interesting, this word that um, most, most Bibles tend to translate as a calf. In actuality, it's more of like a bull. Oh. And, and so they fashion it into a calf, a bull, or whatever you, you want it to be. And then what do they say? They say something that's really, really not good. They're going to sacrifice to it. But before they sacrifice to it, what did they say, Huey? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jenny said it. He, he, he tells her, they, they say, these are your gods. Uh -huh. They are the ones that brought you up. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like the biggest slap in the face to the God of Israel, isn't it? Uh -huh. This yeah. big golden calf that's been made out of women's earrings and rings is the God that has brought them up. The God who oh. made a way for them to escape from Pharaoh. Oh. Can you imagine? Uh -huh. But Aaron... Doesn't have a backbone, does he? <laughs> what does he do? When he saw the calves, he built an altar. Yeah. 
So have yeah. we have we building of altars in the past in our patterning of reading? We have. Uh -huh. Every time anything significant happens in scripture, an altar is built. Why are altars okay. built? To commemorate the presence of God, right? To allow a space for worship to happen. So that's exactly what Aaron does. So Aaron built an altar, altar in front of the calf. And then he said this. There's going to be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. Early the next morning, they arose, offered burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. And the people sat down, and then they started to eat. They drank. And then what did they do? Started a party. Indulged in pagan revelry. Yes. Indulged in pagan revelry. Revelry. Okay, so that's kind of a nice way to say something that I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, because the truth of it is, is that these people were in, uh, engaged in, in, in orgies, and they were having, you know, crazy parties, sexual in nature with one another, and um, just acting a fool, to be quite honest acting in a way that was so unbecoming of the God yes. that had protected them. Uh -huh. But we, we recognize also that they're no longer reverencing the God who protected them, right? They're reverencing a stupid golden calf, right? Uh -huh. So essentially what we have on our hands is a people out of control. So lots of eating and drinking, and lots of sex going on at the base of the mountain surrounding a gold calf. You can imagine, that's kind of a, a weird picture, isn't it? Uh-huh, yeah. So, the God of Israel, he is pissed, he is so mad, he is angry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because he sees what's going on. Yeah. So the Lord spoke to Moses and said, go down at once. Get off this mountain with me. You need to be down there with your people. For your people that you brought <clears throat> from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. Okay, so that's our first indication. The God of Israel knows they have been bad. They've quickly, quickly turned from the way I commanded them. And previous to this, y'all, remember we went through painstakingly what God was asking them to do. And what was it always that he was asking them to do? Simply at the base level is this, obey me. Choose me and obey me. That's all I ask of you, Israel. <laughs> Choose me, obey me, and love me, you know? So in his commands, they, they made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it. So they've reverenced to it. They have sacrificed to it. That's why we built an altar and said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Oh, these people are now proclaiming that the calves are the ones who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. But then the Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people and they are indeed stiff necked. Stiff necked, obstinate, unwilling to obey. Set about doing it your own way. Uh huh. Yes. So now, Moses, I want you to leave me alone so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So have we seen this kind of language before? Because we have. And I referenced it earlier. This um, notion of God's anger burning against his people and him wanting to destroy his people. 
Do y'all remember when that happened? It was with Noah's Ark. Do you guys remember um, the land was filled with wickedness and there was not any goodness left in the world except for one man and his family, Noah, who God called righteous. Noah was the righteous one. And so what did he say to Noah? I'm going to destroy the earth, right? And he did, saving only one man and his family. The promise given to Noah Noah. is not only the rainbow, the promise of never destroying his people again, but also the promise of of, um, nationhood afterwards, right? So starting in verse 11, but Moses, he sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, why does your anger burn against your people who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out with an evil intent to kill them in the mountains and eliminate them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger and relent concerning this disaster planned for your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You swore to them by yourself and you declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and will give your offspring all this land that I promised and they will inherit it forever. So the Lord relented concerning the disaster he said he would bring on his people. Okay, what has just happened here? <clears throat> Moses God. convinced God not to kill all these people, that there is some way to save them, you know. Mm-hmm. And he begs, please don't do that. So he's engaged with a dialogue with Moses, isn't he? Yes. And Moses is advocating on behalf of these stiff-necked people, isn't he? Right. Well, Moses reminds God, if that's possible, uh, that if, of his promise to uh, uh, Abraham and Isaiah. Mm -hmm. about building a a great nation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so um that that promise that he gave to abraham isaac and jacob about um giving you as as many offspring as the stars of the sky and then that coveted land that god had promised to them their home So that must have changed God's mind because the Lord relented. So the Lord decided that he wasn't going to bring disaster on the people. So Moses saved the people of Israel from disaster by going before God and reminding God of his promises. Then Moses turned and he went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, inscribed front and back. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But Moses replied, it's not the sound of a victory cry and not the sound of a cry of defeat. I hear the sound of singing. As he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses became enraged and he threw the tablets out of his hand, smashing them at the base of the mountain. He took the calf they had made, burned it up and ground it into powder. He scattered the powder over the surface of the water and forced the Israelites to drink the water. So we have a a contrast. We have the Lord's 
the Lord basically burning in anger. And now we have most really, really upset, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> What made Moses really upset? Calf. Yeah. But what and specifically about the calf? What was happening at the calf? Well, they were paying respect to this calf and they were celebrating, they were eating, behaving immorally, uh, dancing. Yeah. And he was so angry, he threw the tablets on the ground. He did, yes. And what's interesting, you know, this is the man who's just gone before God and has advocated for these people. And so oh. he's coming down the mountain and he hears something and it maybe, maybe it's a cry of uh, a victory maybe it's a cry of defeat and then he rounds the corner oh no it's neither of those two things what is it it's these crazy people dancing around this golden calf i just was in front of the god of the universe advocating on behalf of you all and i come around the bend and you are acting a fool so he took the tablets he threw them down so what does that mean he threw them down so remember the the tablets contained what god expects of his people right ten commandments the ten commandments how to live closely with god follow these ten things so what is significant about moses smashing these tablets once again he's got a bad temper yeah rightly so couldn't hear what she said she said he's got a bad temper moses has a bad temper and i said rightly so but what does it mean for moses to throw down and smash these laws that have been given to a people by a god who loves them i think there's the concern that they're such idiots that they'll worship the rocks with God's handwriting rather than the words that are on them. Hmm. You know, like so many people know the Bible verses, but don't actually like do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That has something to do with that. Yeah. Really great point, Melody. I just wonder if, you know, Moses was just so fed up. You know, he's like these people. They don't listen to anything. They don't obey God. Why do they need these tablets? They're not going to listen anyway. So regardless, the tablets are now broken. They've been pulverized, <laughs> ground up to essential, uh, they're dust now. They're no longer readable but i guess they are drinkable because what does moses do <laughs> he puts them into the water and makes them drink and forces the israelites to drink it <coughs> now that's oh. super significant maybe if you won't obey it by reading the tablets maybe if they're all ground up and you ingest the tablets maybe then you will start to understand and live by what god has commanded oh how about that uh -huh. that's an interesting way to look at it you know these people weren't going to obey on a written tablet the words of god but as soon as moses broke them and pulverized them and put them in the water these israelites were forced to ingest the word of god oh uh -huh. well, let's continue verse 21 then moses asked aaron remember aaron is his brother 
what did these people do to you that you have led them into such a grave sin? Dude, I've only been gone for 40 days. What in the world did these people do to you that you have led them so far down a path that I never intended you to go? Don't be enraged, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know that the people are intent on evil. So he can't even take responsibility. He's throwing it back on the people. <laughs> they said to me, make gods for us who will go before us. Because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me. And when I threw it into the fire, out came a calf. <laughs> it is a bit comical, isn't it? <laughs> so when Moses went up to the mountain, he appointed his brother Aaron. Okay, now you are in charge of these people. <laughs> I know I can probably pretty well say with certainty Moses never imagined his brother asking people to take off their gold earrings and give them to him so he could fashion it after a calf and begin worshiping them right no and then when called on into question about it he will not accept responsibility in fact he says he puts it all back on the Israelites And so he said to them, or he then said, you know, I just kind of asked for some gold and put it in a, like a little thing and out came a calf. <laughs> so what he's doing, or at least what I see he's doing, he is, he is usurping all um, responsibility here. He is not uh -huh. wanting to do it, is he? No. Even the part about creating a calf, which we know he did. Because he asked for the gold, right? Uh -huh. So he won't take responsibility for anything. And he's throwing responsibility back on the people that he has been given charge uh -huh. for. Yeah. Does that sound like a good leader? No. Oh. No, 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 no. So, verse 25, Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out to their enemies. And Moses stood at the camp's entrance and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites gathered around him. He told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, every man fasten his sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from entrance to entrance, and each of you kill his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 men fell dead that day among the people. Afterwards, Moses said, today you have been dedicated to the Lord, since each man went against his son and his brother. Therefore, you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. The following day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a grave sin. They've made a God of gold for themselves. Now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. See, my angel will go before you, but on the day I settle accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for what they did with the calf Aaron had made.
<clears throat> All right. So does this end well? No. No. No, it doesn't. No. Moses goes to the people and he is honest with them in verse 30. Moses said to the people, you have committed a grave sin. That's not a phrase that we hear very often, is it? Kind of an old way to say grave sin, a bad sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps, perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord. These people have committed for themselves, or committed a grave sin. They've made a God of gold for themselves. Now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. What I find so interesting is just this back and forth between Moses and God, you know, this the bargaining and the, the petitioning that Moses does on behalf of these people and how God doesn't have to, but he chooses to listen. He chooses to um, change his mind. Now I know that that is a, an uncomfortable thing for a lot of people to hear about, you know, does God's mind change? Can God be persuaded? Especially, you know, people who believe that things are already ordained in life. But there is no doubt in this particular passage of scripture, we see that that, that is exactly what happened. Moses went before God and God was set on destruction of a people and he chose not to because Moses interceded. And here again, Moses tries to atone. And what does God say to Moses? Whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now, go, lead the people to the place I told you about. See, my angel will go before you. So the day I settle accounts, I will hold them accountable. Oh, okay. then. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for what they did with the calf Aaron had made. So God is still going to get these stiff-necked people to the land that he has promised. Uh-huh. And he's even going to send an angel to help do it. Have we seen that before? An angel that goes before? Uh-huh. Yes. When they left Egypt, there was a messenger of God, the fire that went before these people to help get them out. But at the same time, what is God going to do? God's going to hold these people accountable for their sin. Yeah. They're not getting off you know, footloose and fancy free. Yeah. And so what happens? God, Send. God brought a plague hey. upon these people. That's right. Isn't a plague supposed to kill them? It depends. Or just make them sick. Yeah. Plagues at the base level um, are supposed to make people uncomfortable, Teddy. So yeah, we know that there's the plague of death and um, um, we know from the story of Exodus at the beginning, remember all of those plagues that came, locusts and flies uh -huh, and uh -huh. um, blood in the Nile River. Um, some of them were not meant to kill. All of them were meant to make life uncomfortable. So it's not for certain what it means here, which plague or what kind of plague it was. Obviously, if these people are delivered to another, the promised land, it wasn't a plague that killed them, but it was probably a plague that made them very, very uncomfortable. A punishment, they must right? Have gotten their attention. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Something, right, something to make them uncomfortable, something to get their attention. I would agree with that wholeheartedly, Teddy, yes. Okay. 
So what kind of thoughts come up inside of you guys with the reading of chapter 32? Is there anything that's weird or that sticks out or it's kind of nice kind of going through paragraph by paragraph, isn't it? To get a fuller picture of what's going on. These people were not acting well. Uh, for, for me, it was uh, Aaron's uh, easily was swayed to do to make the golden calf. But yet after, but yet afterwards, uh, God appoints him the head priest. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I'm reminded, Huey, in, in, in just that example of how um, just the story of faith and the story of God is one in which redemption is always happening, right? Uh -huh. So in one moment, we can have the worst moment ever. And then, you know, we can also rise to the occasion and redemption can happen and resurrection can happen. And I think that's what happened with Aaron. Yes. It's interesting to me the, how the Levite tribe first began. I, I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. With all the killings. Yeah. Who's with me or who's against me? Right. So um, Teresa was talking about how the Levites went in and killed so many people. It was a pretty bad day of bloodshed that day, huh? Yes. Yes. What surprised me, Suzanne, in the beginning, the Lord, God had brought them so far. He fed them, he clothed them, he, he did everything for them. And now they're parked here. And, and just because 40 days with no sign, they say, okay, this, let's just do it our way. Hmm. With no faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they just totally like forgot everything good that had happened because of God. That is so true. And, um, Can I read something to you? That's kind of, I think, very translatable to um, that whole notion. Um, that notion of waiting and sometimes, you know, um, that, that waiting can be so, so difficult. And that's where oh. kind of my heart, you know, really kind of resides this morning with this text. If you're feeling frustrated that you can't see clearly or nothing seems to be happening, if you're stuck, offer all of that to God in your prayers. Try to wait patiently, but with a deep hope and trust and confidence that God is actually at work deep within you. Something is happening, something deep and mysterious. And the time will come when, we, when you will see, and it will be a kind of resurrection. God will delight in surprising you, and you will know in your own life these wonderful words of Isaiah. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I kind of alluded to this in my sermon on Sunday. You know, we're, we're a culture that doesn't like to wait. And I guess the same is true for this culture back, you know, um, thousands of years ago and like I said in my sermon there are just characteristics of humanity that do not change no matter how many centuries go by and and you're right Teddy waiting is not something that most of us like to do first of all 
and most of all, I think we would really kind of join in and say it's not easy to wait. No. no. So on that level, I can understand and I can enter into these people's story, you know. I mean, we have kind of the luxury of knowing it was for only four days. They didn't know that. So I can do anything for 40 days, right? <laughs> what if it's 40 years? What if it's, you know, 40, 40 days times, you know, seven, 280 days, you know? Um, how long do we have to wait before we know what God wants us to do or where God is leading us? That is, that is the hard work of, of the life of faith, isn't it? Absolutely. And I tried to say it on Sunday, you know, faith is sometimes as simple as just putting one foot in front of the other. Uh -huh. Yeah. Not rushing, but just being present to what is. And trusting, and I think that's the part that, you know, waiting and trusting and, and, and believing that even when we don't see things happening or when we don't see that God is actually at work because our human understanding or our human eyes don't see it doesn't mean something's not happening right uh -huh. yes 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 we have to believe that instead something is happening uh-huh yes something you know deep something mysterious And as people of faith, we also have to believe in due time that it will be revealed. And after the waiting, it will feel, it will seem like resurrection. Mm -hmm. So it's what we choose to do in the waiting time that really reveals character uh -huh. and devotion to God, right? Because it's easy to be devoted to God when you're getting everything that you want, right? When life, uh -huh. <laughs> your family's healthy, you don't have problems, you know. Oh, yeah, God is great. Uh -huh. But what happens when you no longer have that to cling to? Can you then call upon the name of God and believe? That he's with you and that he hasn't abandoned you even though times are really really hard and uncertainty seems to be all around and you can't see clearly nothing seems to be happening and you just feel stuck it's not a fun place to be no, 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 no. <laughs> Not. God knows that. And so why, there, that's why there's so many scripture passages about it, waiting on God, hoping. Because that is another, I think, um, characteristic of humanity. We will all face those times that will be hard. We will all face trials. Mm -hmm. We will all come to a place in our life where we feel stuck and we can't see our way out of a box. Mm -hmm. And it is then that we have to call upon those things that we know. And at the base level, what we know, or at least I hope we all know, and we can remember, first of all, is that we're never alone. 
no matter how alone we feel, <laughs> we're not. And secondly, even though I've been to seminary twice and I've read more theological books than I care to admit, my theology is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible told me so. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I learned that when I was three. Mm -hmm. So this is a multi-layered story. I mean, there's no, you know, it'd be easy to point fingers at the Israelites and just say what an idiot group of people that they are. But I see myself so much in this story and it's not a, I'm, I'm, I'm all high and mighty and they're so stupid. It, it is a people who were told to wait and they didn't. And this is what happened. So this is a people who were asked to obey the God who had delivered them. And they didn't. But this is also the story of a man who wouldn't give up on these people. Yeah. And more yeah. importantly, it is a story about a God who wouldn't give up on them either. So if that's not good word for us, good words for us today, I don't know what is. Because I still believe that to be true of us. God will never give up on us. Ever. We may on him he will never on us. So this is what the story of the golden calf is for me. I don't know if you guys fall in line with it or think that I'm crazy as, I don't know, it's not how you read it, but this is just where I enter into the story. There are a lot of similarities between us and them. I think when you can enter into a story, you can find yourself there, right? And history keeps repeating itself, doesn't it? We still stray from God, and we still make idols of things that shouldn't be idols. I can't tell you how many times I have to sing the song to myself during the course of a week. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Christ. and everything else that we make a God is shifting sand, is sinking sand, is not lasting. And as we see in this story, the calf can be pulverized, tablets can be pulverized, But the true God still remains, right? And is with us. Any other parting words? I think I just preached another sermon, round two of Sunday. <laughs> you may not have wanted to hear that, but 
Oh, mercy. It was good, y'all. Enjoyed it. Any other parting thoughts? Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you all for your time this morning. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time. We thank you, God, for your spirit and how you are always so faithful when we humbly come to you wanting to know more of you. God, if any of us this morning are struggling about what it means to wait on you, what it means to trust abundantly in your presence, in your peace. I hope and pray that this time together will ye and bolster all of us together. I know it's hard to wait. I know it's hard to be patient. But sometimes that is what exactly you need for us to do. And I pray that we would have the strength to do it and to do it faithfully, oh God. Help us, Lord, to ever keep our eyes on you. And help us, oh God trust that you are with us and we are never alone and final blessing for this morning blessed are you who bear the light in unbearable times who testify to its endurance amid the unendurable who bear witness to its persistence when everything seems in shadow and grief blessed are you in whom the light lives in whom the brightness blazes. Your heart is a chapel, an altar where in the deepest night can be seen the fire that sh shines forth in you, in unaccountable faith, in stubborn hope, in love that illumines every single broken thing it finds. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you all, my friends. Also with you. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, okay? Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Bye. Thanks, Melody.